All right, I want to do a study here on um, the pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, it's going to be a little, bit, a little bit more detailed. There's going to be a lot of scripture, actually a whole lot of scripture. It's going to take a while to get this study done because it's going to be pretty in-depth. I'm probably going to have to put it into at least two parts. I'm going to try to get that done in that amount of time. So just uh, get ready for it. I mean, I'm going to give you a fair warning. There's going to be a lot of scripture covered here. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, now first of all, I'll uh, tell you a little story here kind of to lead into this thing. Uh, a number of years ago, I was going for a hike with my uh, nephews. And uh, the one asked me, he said, um, Uncle Brian, he said, uh, are Christians going to go through the tribulation? And I said, well, let me ask you, I'll answer that with a question. My question for you is, what is the tribulation? And, you know, he just kind of got this confused look on his face, and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, what is the tribulation? I mean, who causes it? Where does it come from? Is it some kind of a, a bad, you know, weather system or something, and it makes a lot of trouble? Or where does the tribulation come from? And, you know, a lot of people don't ask that basic question. What is this thing called the tribulation? And that's what I want to talk about here in this first part. What is the tribulation? Well, to begin, let me just state that the term the tribulation or the great tribulation actually occur, occurs nowhere in the entire Bible. Uh, there shall be great tribulation, but the term the great tribulation is not a Bible term. Now, people have been saying it for a long time, so I'm not trying to say, you know, we sh you shouldn't say it. Or something. You know, it, it's kind of a well-established thing, so, you know, I, I'm not going to try to get rid of it here or anything. I'll, I'll probably say the tribulation myself a couple times. But the point is, um, saying, calling the seven-year time period coming up, calling it the tribulation, has led a lot of people to falsely believe, to falsely tie it into verses where, the Bible says that Christians are going to go through tribulation. Okay? And that's you can't tie it in with those. So what's the actual name for this? I mean, is there an actual name for this seven-year time period? Well, yeah, it's actually called two different things. Uh, the one is a specific title given for it. And I have the verses all typed out here, so I'm going to... There's not going to be any time for you to be turning to these because I'm just... I'm going to be reading them. It's going to be very fast. Of course, you can pause this uh, message and you can look them up. Um, but we're going to start out in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now, has that happened? Uh, I know I covered this in another one of my messages, but I need to go over it again. Has Israel come back to the land that God gave to their fathers? Yes. Israel is a nation right now, with their own government and their own laws. Okay, that hasn't existed for many thousands of years now. Um, Jeremiah 30, verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. The Lord makes it very clear, by the way, that it is Israel and Judah that he's speaking about. It's not um, British Israel or the, the white nations now that are Israel. That stuff is nonsense. Don't fall for that. Uh, verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Now that's very interesting, uh, because in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, it says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall pros prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. 
He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now, who's it talking about? Well, it's talking about the Antichrist. Okay? And notice there in verse 25, it says, of Daniel chapter 8, it says, And by peace he shall destroy, and by peace shall destroy many. You see, I've heard for many years now that the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be peaceful. Well, I don't know where that teaching comes from. And uh, because all the accounts I've read of it, uh, I don't believe it is a peaceful time. And uh, if you want to go to Revelation 6, 1 and 2, where you actually have the Antichrist being loosed on the earth, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He didn't go out with a little bouquet of flowers to make peace and love in the world. <laughs> he went out to conquer. Okay, war. By peace, it says he'll, he shall destroy many. So the Antichrist does not come and bring in world peace. Now, it's the concept of it, okay? It's, it's, we need to, to fight against these nations, these rogue nations, these terrorists, if you will, to bring in peace. So the, the philosophy there, the people are going to accept him because he's fighting for world peace, but he's going to actually be a conqueror. He's going to be a soldier, a, a warmonger. Okay, so that's important to keep that in mind, that this time period is, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 5 says uh, that it's he heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Well, that's the time period we're headed into. Uh, don't let anybody deceive you that we're heading for peace. We're not. All right, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child? Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Now, why in the tribulation, which this time of Jacob's trouble, that's what it's called, that's the real name for the seven-year period, but I'll, again, I'm going to refer to it as the tribulation because that's kind of the accepted thing. But why is the Lord seeing here why is he saying that, that there are going to be men with their hands on their loins like a woman in travail with child? Why? Well, Revelation thirteen sixteen, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Of course, most people are aware of that. Six 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 is the mark, the the number of the beast, and it will be associated with the mark of the beast. But it says there, no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. So in the tribulation, the saved Jews in Israel, the ones that you know do want to get saved, they are not going to be able to take the mark of the beast, and therefore, what will happen? Well, they're going to be starving. That's why their hands are on their loins, okay? On their stomach, essentially, is what you're talking about there. And, and it says about their faces are turned into paleness. That's what happens when you don't have food, when you're starving. And Matthew chapter 24, verse 19 says, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. A breastfeeding mother, of course, is going to have a very hard time because she's not going to be able to buy food for her children either. So it's going to be a very, very rough time for the Jews. Now here we are, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Here we see the name of it. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Okay, now day just doesn't mean one day. Okay, the day there is a period of time. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, if you get saved out of it, then what does that mean? That means you have to be going through it. I mean, if you call me up and you say, hey, well, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What's, you know, what are you doing right now? Well, I just took some uh, biscuits out of the oven. 
well, where were the biscuits before you called? They were in the oven, okay? And in like manner, somebody gets saved out of the time of Jacob's trouble, they were going through it. They were in it. Okay, but now what about this thing of Jacob? Who's Jacob? You know, could that be the Gentile nations of the uh, white European nations? Well, Jer or, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 32, verse 27 says, And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. God called Jacob Israel. So what is the time of Jacob's trouble? It's the time of Israel's trouble. Okay, that's very, very clear. And you see the thing about Israel and Judah all throughout this section here in Jeremiah chapter 30. It is not referring to the United States or something ridiculous like that. Don't fall for that. Jeremiah 30 verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him uh, but they will, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now, what's this thing about David their king being raised up? Is God going to bring David back to life and and then he'll rule? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the throne of David. And uh, Isaiah chapter nine verse five speaks of this time uh, coming in the future, and it says. Isaiah 9, 5, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Now that doesn't really pertain to what I'm trying to get across here, but I just wanted to add that verse in there. I'm actually going to look, in, I want to look more at uh, verses not, uh, 6 and 7. But verse 5 there talks about this battle that's coming being with fuel of fire. It's pretty amazing. Because back when this thing was written, there was no such thing as uh, internal combustion engines. But that's exactly what we have now. All of our military vehicles are fueled by fire. Okay, you get the gas going in and, the, and mixing with the air, and then the spark plug goes and you have fire. And that pushes the piston down and, you know, makes everything work. I'm not going to go through all that. But the point is, right there you have the King James Bible accurately predicting something that would come to pass many thousands of years after this was written. And even if you want to go back to 1611, when the King James Bible was written, just amazing that it would say fuel of fire there. But anyhow, let's continue here. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, these two, next two verses are pretty familiar, I think, to a lot of people. It says, uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Is that David? No. It's Jesus Christ. Verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now this kingdom, you can read about it in Revelation chapter 20. It comes in, actually Revelation 19, you can read about Jesus Christ coming back down with the saints. And making war on the Antichrist and the false prophet and then their armies as well. And I think that that's the, your battle there that's going to be with fuel of fire. But then this kingdom that's made is brought in by Jesus Christ. It's not brought in by man. Okay, and then Jesus shows up at the end of the thousand years. That's called post-millennialism. And it's ridiculous. Uh, man is not going to bring in a, th in a thousand year kingdom of peace. That's not going to happen. Only Jesus Christ can bring something like that in. Um, Six thousand years of, of human history have proved that man is a consistent failure. Man can't bring in peace for more than 300 years, okay, much less a 1,000 years. And we're not any better than they were in the past, by the way, either, morally speaking. In fact, I think we're probably a lot more wicked. But my point is, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Again, that's this is a whole other study, but you can study the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, 
That's the only thing that the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach an amillennial, that there's no millennial kingdom. That's heresy. And post-millennial coming of Jesus Christ is also heresy. Man is not going to bring in a thousand years of peace. Jesus Christ will. But now Luke chapter 1 verses 30 through 33. I'm going to read that quick. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Jesus Christ was a Jew, by the way. Don't let anybody fool you out of that. Believe in that either. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Okay, Jesus Christ, when he sets up his premillennial kingdom, there's not going to be any end to it. Satan is loosed at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ to go out and deceive the nations. But they come against him and, and there's not even really a battle that time. You know, they just, fire comes down from heaven and just whoosh, just burns them. And that's it. Um, anyhow, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. This is speaking of the millennial kingdom. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So what's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation, if you want to call it that? What's the purpose of it? It is to purify the Jews, okay, to bring them back in line and... Of course, the Jews require a sign, so they're going to get seven years of signs and wonders. And you have the two witnesses coming, Moses and Elijah, I believe. Uh, I believe that that's who it is. And they're going to be, of course, performing signs and, and wonders as well. But before Israel can inherit the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, they're going to have to be punished a little bit. They're going to have to go through this time of Jacob's trouble. Now, notice it doesn't say the time of the church's trouble, the time of the Christian's trouble. No, it's specifically pointed at the Jews. But what about this thing about the Lord making a full end of the nations? Well, Matthew chapter 25, uh, verse 31, you, you have this thing about Jesus Christ coming at the end of the tribulation, and before he sets up the millennial kingdom, he judges the nations. It says, Matthew twenty five thirty one, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. So there you have the kingdom that the Lord promised to the nation of Israel, the Jews. Now what is the other name that uh, is actually given for this um, seven-year period coming up? Well, it's also uh, basically known as Daniel's 70th week. Now this is a, ver a very deep study, and I'm not going to get into all the different details of it, but the point is... Um, there is a, a very good explanation of this thing coming up this seven-year period in Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read down through some of these verses, and we're going to look at some other things. Okay, Daniel 9, chapter 9, verse 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel. Who was Daniel praying about? Israel. Not the white European race that, you know, took over Israel. No. He was praying about Israel. Uh, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the e evening oblation. 
And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I came to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Who's the thy people? Israel. And upon thy holy city, Jerusalem to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay? Again, the thing that will happen, that, that will bring in this millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ ruling from Jerusalem, okay, the most holy there, in verse 24, the thing that will bring that in is this 70th week. Okay, now how many days are in a week? You got seven days. Now, like I said, I can't get into all the, the specifics here, but these days line up as years. Okay, so your week number 70 is going to be a seven-year period. Now, I'm going to show you that here in the next couple of verses. Okay, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the beginning... I'm sorry, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So you have seven weeks plus 62 weeks. The uh, three score and two, a score in the Bible is 20. So you have three score, three times 20 is 60, and two, 62. So 7 plus 62 is 69. Now Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Okay, now let me just stop there. When was Messiah cut off? When was the Messiah of the Jews cut off? Well, when Jesus Christ, he was the Messiah for the Jewish people, and he was executed by them. And it says here in, in verse 26, it says, but not for himself. Was Jesus Christ executed because of his own crimes? No. He was executed. He died on that cross for our sins. Okay? So that's what's going on there. Um, but then it says here, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, the people of the prince there, it doesn't say the prince. Okay, it doesn't say this, this Antichrist type figure. Okay, it's the people of the prince. That's important to note. But it says there too that the end thereof shall be with a flood. Now, that's very interesting. Revelation chapter 12. If you ever look that up, you see this woman and she has these 12 stars around her head and, you know, the the Roman Catholic Church tries to say that it's Mary, the Queen of Heaven, and it isn't. Okay, it's very clearly Israel when you read down through that thing. But verse 12 of Revelation chapter 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The devil gets kicked out of heaven there in Revelation chapter 12. And he's a little mad about it. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, Israel, there. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now what's the time and times and half a time? Well, if you study the thing out, a time is one year, times, plural, is two years, and half a time is a half of a year. One plus two plus a half is three and a half years, exactly halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year period. Okay, that's when this thing is going to happen. That Satan gets kicked out in the middle of the tribulation. He gets kicked out of heaven, and then he comes down here, and he goes after the Jews, which is pretty consistent with history if you 
you know, study Nazi Germany sometime, and you'll see that Satan's man there, Adolf Hitler, didn't like the Jews very much. Uh, so it's very, you know, the, the devil has persecuted the Jews many, many times. But it's going to happen, the worst time that it's going to happen will be during this time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's called that, the time of Jacob's trouble. But I thought it was kind of interesting here, a couple of things I want to make points on. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, I believe halfway through the tribulation that the Antichrist is actually, Satan will probably come down and get into his body. He will be Satan manifest in the flesh, just as Jesus Christ was and is God manifest in the flesh. So Satan is actually going to be physically there, you know, on the TV screens of the world, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. It says there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, that uh, the Antichrist is basically going to go into the temple of God and he's going to cause you know, worship. He's going to ask people to worship him, and he's going to show that he is God. In other words, he's going to actually proclaim that he is God. Of course, he isn't, but he's going to try and show the people that. So when they see that, in Matthew chapter 24, they're told to flee. Okay, now it says there in Revelation 12 about the woman uh, that she is given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Um, but Matthew chapter 24, verse 20 is kind of interesting. It says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, are they actually going to fly into the wilderness? Well, I don't know. That's going to be kind of a hard one to interpret because, of course, we have airplanes now, but if they're going to fly and get away from the Antichrist, uh, more than likely the airports are going to be controlled at that point. Uh, they're already pretty badly controlled right now. Um, so, and, and okay, if they get on airplanes and they take off and they fly out into the wilderness, well, where are they going to land? So, I don't know, I'm, you know, flight could just mean that they're running, too, you know, that's entirely possible. But it says there in Revelation twelve fifteen, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might uh, cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, I thought that was very interesting because Matthew 24, verse 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so, all, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Just thought that was kind of interesting that there you have Satan causing some kind of a flood. And, and again, I don't know all the details of that. I'm not going to be here to find out. But uh, I don't know. It's just very interesting. Uh, Revelation 12:16 says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that's something else that you see differently in this time of Jacob's trouble. You have faith plus works. And a lot of people don't like to, to hear that. They want to think that our plan of salvation that we have right now is just the same from now till forever. Well, I'm sorry, I hate to tell you, but it isn't. Things do change when the rapture happens. Okay, there is a dispensational change there. Okay, and that's something you really need to study out. You see, in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, you can take the mark of the beast and lose your salvation. Okay? You can't take the mark of the beast right now. Why? Well, because he's not around. He hasn't showed up. And don't let there again don't let anybody deceive you on that you know well you have a credit card or you have a bank card or something like this or you have a, a smart card with a chip in it or something well 
You've taken the mark of the beast. No, 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 no. Yeah, I remember when uh, barcodes came out, I've heard some old recordings. People got all excited about the barcodes on products, and they were saying that the that it means 666, and if you buy anything with a barcode, then you've lost your salvation. <laughs> no, don't worry about that stuff. The Antichrist has to show up. Okay, it's connected with him. It's connected with the beast. And worship is connected with it too, by the way. Uh, but that's, again, that's another study. But now, Daniel 9, verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week... He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. There you have him going into the temple and setting himself up as God. Okay, but I, I just want to make one other point before I continue on here, which is kind of interesting. The Jews are going to have to flee into the wilderness. And now the interesting thing about that is, that's exactly what happened in the book of Exodus. They left Egypt. Now, the interesting thing, I don't have this one written down, I'll have to look this one up. But the interesting thing about that is that they're told that they're going to have to flee again there in the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, the Daniel's 70th week, the Great Tribulation, whatever you want to call it. And it says here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it's talking about chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, is talking about the two witnesses that are there and they're prophesying and everything and causing plagues to hit all the people on the earth. And then they're attacked, essentially, by the Antichrist and killed. And it says here, verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. found that kind of interesting. You see, during the seven-year period there, God actually calls Jerusalem. That's where our Lord was crucified. He calls Jerusalem Sodom and Egypt. Now, isn't that interesting that back there in the Old Testament, you had the Israelites having to flee Egypt? And in the future, you're going to have the Israelites having to flee Jerusalem, which is called Sodom and Egypt. Just found that kind of interesting. But now let's look at the next part of this study here. So you have the first part there. This time, this seven-year period is actually more properly called the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's called Daniel's 70th week. Okay, that last week, that last seven-year period will be the end of the suffering for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel. And then the millennial kingdom is set up. So what is the tribulation? The tribulation is for the nation of Israel. It's not for the body of Christ. But now I want to look at this ver this uh excuse me, this word called tribulation. And I'm going to go through there's actually twenty two references to this word tribulation in the Bible and I want to go through and kind of show you that there are two different types of tribulation there's tribulation that comes from the lost world which you know basically comes from man and then there's tribulation that comes from God and I want to show you who these two different types of, of tribulation how they're applied to Jews and then also to Christians and by the way when I say Jews, I mean Old Testament Jews or Jews in the tribulation and out into the millennial kingdom. Right now, if you're Jewish and you're saved, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're a Christian. Okay, you're all one in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek right now. That's the standard. Okay, now let's look at the first reference to the word tribulation. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. I'm going to start at uh, verse 26 and read down through. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, 
but shall utterly be destroyed, and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Verse 30. When thou art in tribulation. Now he's speaking here to a Jew in the Old Testament. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he sware unto them. The Lord promised a kingdom. He promised them that land over there. And he's going to give it to them. And he won't forget them. But notice it says there, when thou art in tribulation, even in the latter days. See, it's not talking about way back then. You know, when Deuteronomy was written, it's talking about a future time period. And it's speaking about Jews in the tribulation. Now let's look at the second reference. The second reference is in Judges 10, verse 14. I'm going to start at verse 11. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Zidonians, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites, did oppress you, and ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand? Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods, Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them de deliver you in the time of your tribulation. The sad thing is, not all Jews in the tribulation are going to get saved. There are going to be some that are trusting in other gods, and they're going to go after them, and God's going to say, Okay, go ahead, go after them. Go after those gods of that are made with man's hands that can't speak or smell or hear. They can't hear your prayers. They can't hear your cries. There will be some that will reject God. You know, there's going to be a lot of them that are going to be bitter. You know, if God's such a loving God, why would he do this to us? Well, you have that today with salvation. So there will be Jews in the tribulation that will reject God. But again, it is Jews in the time of your tribulation there in verse 14. Okay, the next one. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 24. And I'm trying to get context here, so I'm going to start at verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. Because my soul is precious in thine eyes this day, behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch, stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. Verse 24. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. So again, there you see David saying, The Lord will deliver him out of all tribulation. Now, it's interesting there too, because it says back there in Jeremiah about, uh, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So you have the same thing here in verse 24, 1 Samuel 26, 24. Okay, now let's look at the next one. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Here you have the parable of the sower sowing the different seeds. Uh, verse 21. Yet hath he no root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word... By and by he is offended. Now this is great instruction in righteousness for a Christian today. Okay, you you will have converts that 
you know, they receive the gospel with joy. And, you know, you really think that they're saved and whatever. But they start getting a little bit of persecution. And all of a sudden you realize, no, they really didn't get saved. Because they go right back to their sinful past. You know, and, and I've, I've seen that. And it's, you know, a false convert, I think, is one of the most tragic things in this life. And there are a lot of them. In fact, I would say the vast majority of professing Christians are false converts. And one of the ways you can tell is how much are they loved by the world. That's a good way to tell, a good test. But the point is there, uh, when tribulation comes, the false convert um, is offended and he falls away, he goes away. Okay, now that obviously is not seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's just talking about um, in this life you'll have trials and tribulation. Okay, it's just trouble that comes from the the lost world. Okay, so, and we're going to see more of that in as we continue here. Now let's look at the next one. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Notice it does not say the great tribulation. It just says great tribulation. It's explaining what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year period that's coming. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now the elect there are not Christians. Okay, and again, you can study this as another subject, but Hebrews chapter 9 talks about a testament is not a force until the death of the testator. The New Testament did not officially begin until Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, a hyper-dispensationalist will say, well, then you can't read any of the four Gospels. They aren't Pauline in, in their doctrine. Well, I don't agree with that, because the Bible does say that we are to consent to the words of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote that, actually. And there are a lot of things in the four Gospels that are kind of a transition the Lord is saying some things, and it's pointing towards the Gentiles being saved. It's pointing towards, you know, the, the church age that we're now in, and the gospel of uh, grace through faith. Okay, so it is pointing that direction. But in this particular passage here, Matthew chapter 24, you read that thing, it is completely pointed at the Jews, at the nation of Israel. You know, pray that your flight be not on the on the uh, in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Well, we're not told to to keep the Sabbath day as Christians today. They were they were meeting on the first day of the week. I've covered that in other subjects or other uh, sermons. So, Matthew chapter twenty four. And there again, I could do a whole hour just on Matthew chapter twenty four, going verse by verse. It's directly pointed at the Jews. It is pre-crucifixion. Okay, that's where rightly dividing the word of truth comes in. Now, you can go through there, and there's a lot of good instruction and righteousness. But doctrinally, you have to be careful. Okay, now Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 is the next time that this word tribulation shows up. And again, it is speaking of this time period. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Where are the tribes at right now? I don't know of any. But you read Revelation chapter 7, and those tribes, those twelve tribes show up again. And there's 144,000 that are sealed, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. So there you have that in verse 30. But let's continue. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That is at the end of the tribulation. I recently was emailing back and forth with a guy, and he was trying to tell me that this was at the first advent. <laughs> it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I've, heard, I've never heard anything so dumb. 
you know, this is the first advent when Jesus first showed up on the earth. You know, boy, that would make for some interesting uh, Christmas plays, <laughs> you know. Uh, instead of the angels showing up, you know, for the shepherds out there in the, in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Oh, no, no. Now the sun is dark and the moon's dark and, and the stars fall from heaven. And then the Son of Man comes in the clouds and then he zooms down into the manger, you know. <laughs> no. Don't ever fall for that, okay? It's the second advent. Matthew chapter 24 is about the second advent. And Jesus Christ is there. That He's the one that's saying it. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, let's continue on here. Mark chapter 13, verse 24 is the next one. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with, pow with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So there you see, much the same as Matthew chapter 24. Okay, now the next one, John chapter 16, verse 33. Uh, we'll start at verse 32 here. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, but because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Okay, now that's right before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, you're going to go through some pretty hard times coming up, which they did. You know, here their their teacher at that point, you know, he gets taken and he gets executed. And I'm sure, you know, for the couple of days there that they had to endure, I'm sure it was very difficult. They didn't understand what was going on. And Jesus is trying to comfort them and he's saying, you're going to have tribulation. Okay, in this world, in the world ye shall have tribulation, it says there. Now that's true for us today. We've been you know, if you're listening to this and you live in America, you're pretty blessed here in America. I mean, there's starting to come some persecution, some hate crime laws and whatever. But we still enjoy a pretty good amount of freedom in this nation as Christians. But that wasn't so in times past. Okay, study church history sometime. You'll see that Christians have suffered horribly um, down through the centuries. You will have tribulations in this life. Okay, let's look at the next one. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. And again, I want to start at verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 26 says, And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, that was a center for the early Christian church. And of course, that's where your true... Greek manuscripts, they go back to Antioch, and of course your King James Bible is the only one of the English Bibles that's in, in common use today. It's the only one that uh, comes can be traced back to Antioch. All the other ones are from Alexandria, Egypt. The NIV, the New King James, the New American Standard, all of them. Okay, Again, another subject. Uh, but verse 22 says, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, right now, the post-tribulation people are jumping up and down saying, We got him, we got him, you know, here's proof. We have proof that we're going to go through the tribulation. Well, no, sorry. And they say, well, yeah, but it says, We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is, is the uh, millennial kingdom. No, it isn't. What is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's spiritual. It's not meat and drink. Will there be meat and drink in the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ? Well, of course. See, it's physical. But the kingdom of God is spiritual. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, 
neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And one final verse here to prove this point. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says, and this is a rough one for Christians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You want spiritual power? Well, here's how you get it. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know, it amazes me how Christians, they get saved and they think that they can be more successful than Jesus Christ was when he was here on this earth. Jesus Christ was despised. He was rejected. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus Christ had it rough here. He didn't get along with members of his family. He didn't get along with the, the people, the political crowd. He didn't get along with the educated religious leaders. He didn't get along with very many people. Uh, and, and the people that followed him and were worshiping him one day were calling for his crucifixion the next, you know. And you think that you're going to do better than that. You think that you can be right with Jesus Christ and be popular and loved in this world. Isn't going to happen. I can tell you that. And if you are a Bible-believing Christian, a King James Bible believer, and you stand for the King James Bible and you stand against the new rock and roll music in the modern churches, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have family members that don't like to be around you. You have co-workers that avoid you like you have some kind of a disease. <laughs> and you know I'm right. Now, if you don't know anything about that, if you say, well, I'm getting along with all the members of my family and, and I'm, you know, employee of the month every month at my work, well, then you're not a very good Christian. That's just uh, the fact of it. So what's the solution there to Acts chapter 14, verse 22? The point is, if you want to be in fellowship with God, if you want that kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom, then you're going to have to suffer some tribulation, trials and tribulation. You're going to have to have some trouble. You're going to have to have some people writing you nasty emails and threatening your life and saying you're a hypocrite, you're this, you're that, attacking you. That's tribulation. Okay, now, Romans chapter 2, verse 9 is the next one. I'm going to start at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now God's judgment and his wrath will be fully manifest in this coming seven year time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, he's got, you know, seven vials of wrath that are poured out. It's going to be a pretty rough time. Okay, Romans 2, 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Good works after you're saved. Okay, not good works to get saved. No, you get saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then your good works come after that. And we have a, a good sermon on that too, by the way, on sermon audio here. Uh, okay, verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Okay? Those that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, those people are the lost people, very clearly. And it's indignation and wrath that comes on them. Okay, now, verse 9, and here's the key to it. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first, time of Jacob's trouble, and also of the Gentile. The Gentiles are going to be whipped around too in the tribulation. So there you have tribulation referring to lost people. Okay, Revelation, or excuse me, Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now verse 3, you see tribulation again here. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts 
by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now that is absolutely 100% true. You know, that is, I can say I have tested and proved that one. And if you are in any kind of Christian ministry, you know that it's true as well. Uh, tribulation worketh patience. When you start getting nasty people writing to you and threatening you and, and you go out and you do door-to-door or some kind of street ministry, the first time you get somebody telling you off or yelling at you or cussing you out or writing to you and calling you a Pharisee and whatever, you know, it, it can hurt you. It can hurt your feelings. It can be kind of scare you, like you don't want to go back and do it again for a little while. But eventually it starts to work patience. You kind of get to expect it after a while. And then experience comes. You know, and somebody calls you a Pharisee after you've been called a Pharisee, you know, 50, 100 times. You kind of just go, yeah, yeah, okay. I've heard that before. And then hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. If you know you're doing right and you get attacked for it, you don't have to be ashamed of that. In fact, you'll be rewarded for it if you're doing right. Now, if you're doing wrong and you get attacked, well, it's not the same thing. Now, let's look at the next one. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, now, is that talking about the coming seven-year tribulation? No, of course not. Why? Because it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, and it goes down through, and or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Study church history, and you'll see that that is exactly what happened. They were slaughtered. Christians were slaughtered for centuries by the Roman Catholic Church, by the way. They were attacked and just viciously tortured and murdered, and just horrible. I mean, read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometimes. I mean, it, it's incredible how the body of Christ has had to suffer down through the centuries. But who's the persecution coming from? Who's the tribulation coming from? Is it coming from God? No. It's coming from sinful man. Now, in the tribulation, in the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, who's that coming from? Who causes that time period? God does, not man. Man is not the cause of the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven vials. It's God who causes it. So it's not the same thing. But now look at verse 38. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come and then you go down here and it says, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, I've got to tell you something. This is not for a tribulation saint, whether a Jew or a Gentile. This is for a Christian right now. You see, in the tribulation, you can be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can be separated if you take the mark of the beast. So you see, this is true for us today, but it is not true for a tribulation Jew or a Gentile. Okay, and there is a, a difference between the two, by the way, in the tribulation. Right now you're just a Christian if you're Jew or Gentile. You're saved, you're a Christian. In the tribulation, those two groups are split. And we'll see that too. Uh, you can see that in Revelation 7, uh, which we'll be getting to in a little bit. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Again, 
Who's the tribulation coming from? God or the world? The world, very obviously. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which were in any, or which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, one of the three things that you will find about the tribulation, the, the rapture, excuse me, the rapture before the tribulation, it's three things. I did a message on this one time years ago. It's three things. It's a blessed hope, it's a comforting hope, and it's a purifying hope. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 is one of the most famous of the rapture passages. And it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So there's your comfort. You're not going to have to go through God's wrath being poured out and God's judgment being poured out. Now, you are going to go through the judgment seat of Christ. And these post-tribulation rapture people, they just kind of eliminate that, which is very interesting. So you aren't getting away from judgment. Okay, If you're a Christian, you're going to go through the judgment seat of Christ and your works will be tried. You won't be. Your works will be tried by fire. Okay, But that's, again, another study. So it's a comforting thing to know that you're not going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble and risk losing your salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Now that's true for a Christian today. Very true for a Christian it doesn't really matter how much tribulation you get, you can still have joy. Why? Because you know that you're going to be saved or that you are saved and that you're going to be with the Lord someday. And as bad as it gets down here, we, we are assured that we're not going to have to go through that time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to be taken out before that. Let's continue on here. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse one. Wherefore we could be Excuse me. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer, in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. What were the things that they were appointed to? Verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and ye know. The tribulation that they're talking about there was happening back then. So it's not a reference to a, this future time period, the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. And they were going through some very hard times back there in the first century, as I stated earlier. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Remember that. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to you, the Christians. No, it doesn't say that. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense Tribulation to them that trouble you. God is going to recompense tribulation to all the people that hate Christians right now. All these wicked people out there that hate Jesus Christ and hate the King James Bible and everything else. God's going to recompense tribulation. Seven years of it. To those people. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now that's a reference to the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you say, oh, well then, see, again, it proves a post-tribulation rapture, because we're going to be there and we're going to get to see it. Uh, that doesn't prove a post-tribulation rapture. We will be there, but we are the saints that come back down with Jesus Christ. You see, we're up in heaven in Revelation 19, and we come down with Jesus Christ. Now, if we come down, then that means we have to first go up. <laughs> I know that's very difficult for some people to understand, but, you know, try, try again. Revelation 1.9 I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Was John facing some tribulation, some trouble down here? Yes. Here he is, he's an older man, and he got arrested for preaching probably, and, and they stuck him on an island, <laughs> you know. And it wasn't a neat, you know, shipwrecked uh, Gilligan's Island kind of a thing. It was it was rough. You know, they'd ex exile you on one of those islands. You know, you were trying to find whatever food you could. And, I mean, it was a tough thing being out there. So, yeah, he was having tribulation, trouble, okay? Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews but and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Is it speaking of a seven-year period? No. A ten-day period. And he's speaking to a church there, in the church age. The church in Smyrna. It has nothing to do with the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation 2.18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Who is Jezebel? Well, if you read in Revelation 17, you get a much fuller explanation of who this woman is. It says there, Revelation 17, verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of the what? Excuse me, with the wine of her fornication. Verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar. Watch any newscast about Rome. You'll see the archbishops and cardinals and all that stuff. They're wearing purple and scarlet. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
Now jump down to verse 18 there of Revelation 17, and it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now it's very clear when you study the thing that this city, this woman, this harlot, is the Roman Catholic Church. Very, very, very clear. She is the one who's guilty with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Study church history. Okay, no other city has killed and slaughtered Christians like Rome has. And I've done other things on that, um, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. But it says there that those who commit fornication, adultery, with this woman, this Jezebel, this mystery Babylon, those who join up with her are going to go through great tribulation. And I believe that all these apostates out there that are getting involved in this ecumenical movement, I believe that they are going to go, I don't believe that they're saved, or else they wouldn't be doing it, joining with the Catholic Church, and I believe that they're going to go through the Great Tribulation. Okay? So there again, it's not the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, as we're also called. It's a false, you know, not truly saved group of people who are linking up to the Catholic Church. They're the ones that are going to go into that Great Tribulation time period. All right, a couple more references here, then we're done. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14 is the next one. Now, if you want to read Revelation 7 sometime, verses 1 through 8, talk about uh, the 144,000 sealed Jews, not Jehovah's Witnesses, sorry, but uh, they're Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Verse 9 says, Revelation 7, verse 9, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay, now, let me just say there, it's uh, of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues. These aren't Jews. The Jews are there in verse 1 through 8. These are a group of Gentiles. Verse 10, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. You know, I'm really looking forward to that. I just want to stop for a second and just say, you know, that that just, to be there. And to actually be able to praise God and know that I'm safe now. I don't have to worry about sin anymore. I don't have to worry about these, you know, people down here that hate Jesus Christ. To be there in heaven and actually worship God right there in front of us. I mean, it's going to be tremendous. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now again, the post-tribulation people go, Oh, see, 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 you go through the tribulation. These people are come, they came out of great tribulation. That's Christians. Well, wrong again. It's not Christians. It's tribulation saints. Okay? These people, what's going to happen at the rapture? Sadly, there are a lot of people that think that they're saved right now. They think that they're born again, and they're not. They prayed some magical little prayer and raised their hand, and now you're saved. But there's been no change in their lives. The Bible says if, if any man is in, be in Christ, he is a new creature. And you have a lot of these people who profess to be saved, and there's no change in their life and these people are going to be left behind by the millions and they're going to realize the news media whatever they're going to say whatever however they're going to spin it and try to explain away the rapture these people are going to realize they're going to know real christians those people that they thought were narrow-minded and bigoted and they're going to say wait a second 
all those Bible-believing, those Bible-thumpers, they're all gone. This was the rapture. I missed it. And those people are going to get saved, probably a lot of them, in the tribulation. But notice it says there in verse 14, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. As a Christian, do you wash your robe and make it white in the blood of the Lamb? You see, if you have to wash something, that takes an effort, doesn't it? You might say it's works. You know? Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Here we go. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You don't wash yourself when you get saved right now. Jesus Christ washes you in his blood. Okay? For by grace are ye saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not saved by your own works right now, but they will be in the tribulation. Partly. They are going to have to have faith in Jesus Christ, but they're going to have to endure the tribulation, and they're not going to be able to take the mark of the beast. And they're going to be executed you know, quite a few of them. So, I do not believe that Revelation 7.14 is talking about Christians as far as church-age Christians. I believe that it's talking about tribulation saints, Gentiles that go into the tribulation and they realize that they weren't truly saved and they get saved as a result of the rapture. And there's going to be a lot of them. Okay, Revelation 7.15 Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and, well, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, there you have, I believe, tribulation saints who got saved during the tribulation and then probably were executed and then they are with the Lord up in heaven. <clears throat> okay, I do not believe that they are Christians as far as Christians that are alive now in the church age. Now, I need to wrap this thing up because it's getting pretty long here. Uh, but what have we learned? Well, we learned that this seven-year period is properly called the time of Jacob's trouble. It is primarily, God is going to deal with the Gentiles as well, but it's primarily for the Jews. Okay? It's pointed mostly at them. Now, the saved Gentiles are going to wash their robes, meaning that they're going to have to have faith, but there's also going to be an element of works involved too in the tribulation. If you want to be saved, you can't take the mark of the beast. So there's faith plus works. Now, if they take the mark, they'll be executed. Um, Christians right now in the body of Christ, uh, we are called the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You can read that. Because we are washed in his blood. Ephesians 1, 7. Acts 20, 28 also says about God purchasing us with his blood. Okay, it was God's blood that was shed on the cross. Jesus Christ, God is God manifest in the flesh. Um, and Ephesians 4.30 says that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, now, in the next study, we're going to look at 12 reasons why that the rapture is before this time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to go through the different scriptures that prove a pre-tribulation rapture, and I'm going to show you why Christians cannot go into this time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, so... That's it for now. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, keep an eye out for part two. I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get to it, but Lord willing, it'll be soon here within the next couple of days or a week, maybe at the most. Thanks for listening. 
Okay, today I want to look at 12 reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, again, I have the scriptures typed out if you heard part one of this message. Uh, I do have the scriptures typed out, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. If you want to look them up, of course, pause the recording and uh, you know turn to it in your Bible. But I'm going to move pretty quick because there's a lot to cover. I'm actually going to have have to separate these 12 points into two parts into a two-part message there's just too much scripture to go over so uh let's get started okay reason number one for a pre-tribulation rapture if you listen to the first study you realize that this tribulation thing it's not actually called the tribulation in the bible the proper term for the seven-year period coming up is the time of jacob's trouble okay jacob being israel the jewish people now, that doesn't mean a bunch of white people trying to say that they're Jews and that uh, Joseph of Arimathea went over to England or, or the British Isles or something after the uh, resurrection and, and that's, you know, now he's the founder of the Jewish races. None of that junk. I'm talking about the literal descendants of Shem. Okay, not Japheth. Shem. And not Ham either. And uh, you can study that. It's a whole other issue there. Uh, Genesis 9 and 10, you can read about that. But um, this time coming up is called the time of Jacob's trouble because it's specifically God dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, what does the Bible say about the Jews? Well, from the very beginning, the Jews required a sign. And I'm going to read here the very first time that this term, this word sign, appears in the Bible. Exodus chapter 4, verse 6 says, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first Sign. Now that's the first time that, that word shows up in the Bible, Exodus 4 8. And it says here that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. In other words, if they don't believe you the first time that you you're, put your hand in there and into your bosom and then you bring it out and it's leprous, then they'll believe the second one when you put it back in and it comes out and it's clean. Okay? Exodus 4 9. And it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. find that kind of interesting. Um, you have there Moses, of course, um, going and taking the children of Israel out of Egypt, which is why it's called Exodus. That's the book there, Exodus. But you have one of the signs that was given was the turning of water into blood. And isn't it interesting that that's exactly what happens again in the tribulation, this time of Jacob's trouble. And as I said in the first study, I'm going to call it the tribulation because that's kind of the commonly accepted term. It's not in the Bible as far as the term the tribulation. Listen to the first study. But it's the commonly accepted thing, kind of like rapture or trinity. I'm going to use it. You know what I'm talking about. The seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, or Daniel's 70th week. But you see those signs showing up again, and why? Because the Jews require a sign. Uh, the next one here, Exodus chapter 31, verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So again, you have a bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of professing Christians running around today, and they're trying to say that you have to keep the Sabbath, and, and, that, and that worshiping on Sunday is, is a pagan thing. And of course, they're quite ignorant of Scripture. I've covered this in other, other studies, uh, the non-dispensational Christian contradictions I covered in there and in a few other ones, but the fact is, after the crucifixion, Jesus Christ met with the disciples on the first day of the week, that's Sunday. Paul preached 
on the first day of the week, and they took up a collection on the first day of the week. So it is perfectly fine and acceptable to meet on a Sunday. It's not pagan or antichrist or something ridiculous like that. Nowhere are Christians commanded to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because it's given to the Jews as a sign. That's what the Sabbath day is. Now let's look at Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Here again you have after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's giving the disciples their instructions how to go out and preach. And they're going first to the Jews, by the way. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And let me just stop there for a second. These modern faith healers, they don't have the power to heal anybody. And they say, well, you know, they, they put their hand on somebody and the person doesn't get healed. And they say, well, you didn't have enough faith. You know, it was your problem. Your, it's your fault that you didn't get healed. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they laid hands on the sick and, they, and the sick recovered. No faith involved. Okay, be healed. Blam, they're healed. So these modern faker, uh, faith healers, don't be deceived by them. Uh, Mark sixteen nineteen. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, what's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, it's going to confirm the word with signs following. You're going to have seven years of signs confirming the New Testament to these Jews who right now they reject the New Testament. An Orthodox Jew does not accept the New Testament as being from God. They say it's heretical, it's written by, you know, people that weren't, you know, saved or whatever. They don't agree with the New Testament. But they will in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. There you have that verse, which I've been referring to. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. They say, have you received the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, I got saved. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm washed in the blood, so I got the Holy Ghost. You see, this is a it's a heresy that the charismatic churches teach that the Holy Spirit comes at a different time than that the Lord does. I mean, you accept Jesus Christ and then you got to get the Holy Spirit later. And then you'll have different levels of the Holy Spirit, you know. We talked to a guy the one time we were out door to door and he said, "I don't always have as much of the Holy Ghost as I'd like." <laughs> well, then you better get saved. <laughs> You know, pretty dangerous. But uh, the Jews are the ones that required the signs, and the real sign gifts that were given to the apostles were for the Jews. And when the Jews totally rejected Jesus Christ as a people, now you still had some individual Jews getting saved, but as a nation, when they rejected Jesus Christ, with the apostles going out preaching to them, and they started to persecute the apostles, the sign gifts disappeared. Okay, the signs were given to the apostles. All right, and that's important to realize. The sign gifts are not there today. All right, that's a whole other study, though. Okay, but does, does anybody else bring signs in this time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. When the Antichrist shows up, he's going to deceive people because he's going to perform great and amazing signs and wonders. Uh, verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, before I continue, it says... They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Is this talking about Christians? No. Let me continue. 
Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, these verses have absolutely nothing to do with a Christian right now in the church age. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says that you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. A Christian today, right now, is sealed. You're washed in the blood. You don't have to worry about losing your salvation because it's not your salvation. Okay? God saved you. He purchased you with his own blood. And I heard a guy <clears throat> on Sermon Audio trying to say that this refers to Christians that aren't going to make it through the tribulation because they'll accept the Antichrist and then they'll lose their salvation. They'll be damned. You know, and, and God will send them strong delusion. No, God will send a strong delusion to those who were never saved and they receive not the love of the truth. Okay, this isn't saved people that are losing their salvation. That's just, you know, heresy. That's, that's ridiculous. Now, will the Jews be given signs um, to confirm the New Testament? Yeah, as I already said. And two of the greatest signs that they're going to be given appear in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11.3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, by the way, if you study this thing out, I do believe that these two witnesses are the two men that showed up at the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ. And who were they? Moses and Elijah. It says Elias in, in the New Testament there, because you're coming from Greek to English. But the point is, it's Moses and Elijah. So here you have Moses, who originally brought the Israelites, the children of Israel, brought them out of the land of Egypt. And now you have him showing up again in the time of Jacob's trouble to bring them out of Sodom and Egypt and to get them away from the Antichrist. Okay, let's keep reading here. Revelation eleven seven. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. <clears throat> and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So you have Jerusalem there during the time of Jacob's trouble is not a good place. <laughs> it's called Sodom and Egypt. Revelation 11.9 and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now that's another prophecy that's been fulfilled. Um, this was impossible that the people all over the world, nations and, and tongues and things and kindreds, they wouldn't be able to see their dead bodies laying in the streets for three and a half days unless they had satellite television. So there's another amazing prophecy which has come to pass. We now have that technology. Um, and of course that shows too that the Antichrist is going to be using television. I could do a whole study on that. Like to eventually. But uh, verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. That's one of the reasons for all these horrible things that are going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Because right now people, you know, are not afraid at all to mock God and to make fun of God and to make fun of the Bible and and blaspheme him as often as they want. But when God starts pouring out his wrath on this planet for seven years, 
people are going to start giving glory to God. doesn't mean that they're going to get saved and go to heaven. It just means they're going to recognize, hey, God's real, and they're going to feel some, some fear of God. And the Bible teaches that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there you go. Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Okay, this is describing the second advent. Not the first ad advent, the second advent. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Who are the tribes? Well, there are 12 tribes. Okay, 12 Jewish tribes that show up in Revelation 7. So they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. So the first reason that I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture is because the tribulation is not for Christians. It's for the Jews. And the Jews require a sign. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> not the time of the church's trouble. Reason number two, the Antichrist stands in the rebuilt temple. Okay, Matthew twenty four fifteen says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, most of the people that read that don't understand uh, because they're not dispensational. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You see, right now a Christian does not have a holy place, as far as a physical building made with man's hands. There is no such thing. But they will in the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews will, I should say. Okay, Christians, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And Second Corinthians six sixteen actually goes even farther. It says, "And what hath, or excuse me, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you." And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, if the Antichrist is going to stand in the holy place, does that mean that he's going to stand in the bodies of Christians? Of course not. Don't be ridiculous. No, the Antichrist is going to stand in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. All right, and you can read about that also in other places in the Bible. Back in the book of Daniel, it talks about that. Okay, we, did, we cover that in the other study. So let's continue on here. Reason number three. The tribulation gospel is different than ours. Right now, it's faith plus nothing. Okay, Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross is how you get saved right now. Good works are only there for rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, You do not have to do any kind of works in order to be saved. All you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All right. But in Matthew 24, 13, it says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, when you don't rightly divide the word of truth and you go back to Matthew 24, which doctrinally is in the Old Testament, we're going to look at that later, you take that verse and you say, Well, see, you have to endure to the end. And if you don't endure to the end, well, that you're going to lose your salvation. See, people say, well, I don't think I'd make a big deal about this pre-tribulation rapture thing. Well, I don't agree with that. Because, see, when people begin to believe that you go through the tribulation, they get messed up doctrinally. And one of the first doctrines where they go off on is they don't believe in eternal security. Because eternal security is not there for somebody in the tribulation, unless they're one of the 144,000, and that's because they're sealed. Okay, right now, all Christians are sealed. In the tribulation, only 144,000 Jews will be sealed. Everybody else is going to have to have faith in Jesus Christ, and they're also going to have to have works. And I'm going to show you what the works are. 
Revelation 14, verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, if any man worship the beast. doesn't say if, if those that aren't saved or whatever. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Remember, you have to endure to the end. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you have works and you have faith. Right now, you don't have to worry about taking the mark of the beast. Why? Because the beast hasn't showed up yet. Now, the technology's there, you know, implantable microchips and, and whatever else, and they certainly want to put that into people, but you don't have to worry about that until the beast shows up. And I'm going to show you later that the beast isn't going to show up until Christians are in heaven. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Now... James chapter 1 verse 1. Here's James chapter 2 is one of the ones that, that a lot of preachers will mess up. So we're going to go through some of those verses. But James 1 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Who was the book of James written to? The twelve tribes. When did the twelve tribes show up? Are they right now? No. You aren't going to go over to Jerusalem and say, you know, well, where are the 12 tribes at? They aren't there right now. Now, you might have some people that say, you know, I can trace my lineage back to, you know, Benjamin or one of the others. But the 12 tribes are not officially recognized right now. They will be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Read about in Revelation chapter 7. They show up again. Right now, the Bible teaches there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you are saved today, you are a Christian. Okay? The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Who were the disciples? They were Jews. It didn't say that the twelve the disciples were called the twelve tribes in Antioch. No, they're called Christians. But in the tribulation, you have a difference there. God is starting to deal with the nation of Israel again. Right now, they're kind of on the back burner just waiting to be brought into the time of Jacob's trouble, to be corrected, to be given the signs to confirm the New Testament before they're given the kingdom. So James, the book of James, I believe, is predominantly, now you can get instruction and righteousness from it, but it's predominantly written to the 12 tribes. Now let's show you some problems here that you can have if you try to apply it to Christians today. James 2.14 What doth it profit, my brethren, Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Well, answer the question. Can faith save you today? Absolutely. Uh, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, if you say the whole Bible applies to a Christian, how do you reconcile those two passages? That's why Martin Luther said that he wanted to, that he'd like to start his, his fire with the book of James. See, Martin Luther didn't look at the Bible dispensationally, so he could see that it clearly contradicted there. Not the Bible contradicted, but the interpretation of it. Okay, his interpretation. You have to look at it dispensationally. You have to say, okay, James is writing to the twelve tribes. When do the twelve tribes show up? They show up in the time of Jacob's trouble. And in that time period, the gospel is different than ours. There is an element of works involved with salvation. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, but take the mark of the beast, you lose your salvation. It says, if any man worship the beast in his image. If any man. Doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not. So there is an element of works that's involved in salvation for a tribulation Jew or a tribulation Gentile. James chapter 2, verse 17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. True for a tribulation saint, not true for a Christian. James two twenty four. 
Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Again, true for a tribulation saint, not true for a Christian in the church age that we are currently in. Okay, now reason number four that I believe the pre-tribulation rapture is because the rapture is said to be a mystery by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. So let's look at John chapter 10, and I'll show you why it was called a mystery. John chapter 10, verse 1. Here you have Jesus speaking to Jews. Okay, He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Okay, here you have Jesus Christ speaking this parable to them, and it's a parable about the rapture. Okay, very, very clearly. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And he says, I am the door. Now I'm going to show you here in a couple minutes that this is definitely the rapture. But the second advent was a well-known fact. Okay, It's written about back in the book of Joel a number of times. It's told about the sun being darkened, the moon being darkened, moon turning to blood, you know, and the stars falling from heaven, and then the Son of Man coming back. All of those things are written about in the book of Joel. So these Jews knew about the second advent, but they didn't know about the rapture. So they're all sitting around going, what is he talking about? Where is this thing of when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, where does he call his sheep? Where is he showing up as a door? And where is he leading them out? Jesus comes down at the second advent. He doesn't lead anybody out. Okay? And they're confused. They're going, what, what is he talking about? Let's continue here. Verse 7, John 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go, shall go, now look at this, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now think about it with the teaching of the rapture. At the pre-tribulation rapture, Jesus Christ comes in the clouds and calls us out. Okay, we go in to heaven with Jesus Christ. We go up to meet him in the clouds and then we go with, with him back to heaven. We go in. Revelation chapter 19, we come back with Jesus Christ down to the earth. Okay, so we go out of heaven. And what do we do when we get down here? We find pasture. We enter the millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ as king of kings and lord of lords, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about. Okay, this has nothing to do with the second advent. That's why the Jews didn't understand it. Now, let me read another verse here. For Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, this is John writing here. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the door of the sheep. Okay, back to Revelation. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. John experienced the rapture of the body of Christ. Okay, he was fast forwarded in time. That's why he saw the tribulation. The, the tribulation hasn't happened yet. So it wasn't something in the past that John saw that he wrote about. No, the Lord brought him forward in time to our future, actually. 
Okay, now back to the, to uh, John chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 10 now. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Did Jesus give his life for his sheep? Yes. Verse 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hiring, hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. You know, it's kind of sad how many preachers out there don't have the guts to stand up against Rome and don't have the guts to stand up against the new versions. And it, it's not a matter of being brave and courageous. It's a matter of conviction. If you know something is wrong, then you have a responsibility to stand up against it. But a lot of times the hireling is more concerned about his salary than he is about actually protecting the sheep that are under his care that he's an overseer of. Again, another subject. Okay, um, verse 14, John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What's Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. And he says here, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Well, who's he talking about? He's talking about Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. When you get up there to heaven at the rapture, it's not going to be okay now. that You Jews, you go over there to that section of heaven, and, and you Gentile believers, you go over there. That's not how it's going to be. You're not going to have Peter and Paul and James and John sitting over at one table and, and D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and you know the other Gentiles sitting over there at another. No, we're all going to be one. Okay, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Look at verse 19. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. The truth always does divide people. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. And here you have the mystery. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay? Paul there is speaking of the mystery that Jesus Christ said to these Jews back in the book of John, chapter 10, and they didn't understand it. And nobody really understood it. They were all thinking there was just going to be the second coming. Nobody knew about this rapture of the body of Christ. But here Paul talks about it. And notice he says it's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And if you remember there in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, <clears throat> well actually verse 2, he says, And immediately I was in the Spirit. So it was in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, when he when the sun is darkened and the moon's darkened and the stars fall from heaven and then the Son of Man appears in the clouds, um, that's not going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? The rapture will. Now, number five, the reason number five why I believe in a pre tribulation rapture is because there's absolutely no mention of the resurrection of dead saints at Christ's second coming. First Corinthians fifteen verse thirty three, we'll continue in first Corinthians here. Uh, it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? It's talking about the resurrection there, being changed instantly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Boom. At the last trump, which we'll get into later. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Keep that in mind. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Where is that at? At the second coming. Where do you see dead saints coming up to meet the Lord in the air? And then the live saints going up too. Where do you see it? It's not there. Read the passages about the second coming. We're going to look at some of this right now. <clears throat> uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Okay, now, was this thing of the subject of... I, I Okay, I kind of got ahead of myself here. I had a guy write to me and he said that 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 57 was a... 53, excuse me, 53 through 57. He said, that's about the resurrection and, and it, this is the mystery that they didn't know about. Um, that's not true. Because here you have... Matthew 17, 1 through 17, 3, the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elias show up. Yes, they certainly knew that the dead saints are going to be resurrected. Okay, they saw two of them right there. And by the way, it's there you have Moses and Elias, which I believe are the two witnesses in the tribulation. Now, Matthew chapter 22, verse 31. Let's look about the resurrection of the dead again. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Matthew 27, 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. This thing of, well, well, Paul was saying the mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, that mystery was about the resurrection. No, it was not. The people knew all about the resurrection. Okay, They saw dead saints coming back to life. And I don't think that they were walking around as skeletons or half-rotted corpses. I think that they had resurrection bodies. But again, the Old Testament saints are a different group than the church age saints. Okay? Again, a whole other thing there. Let's continue on here. Now let's look at <clears throat> the second advent here. This is Matthew chapter 24. That's the greatest chapter in the entire New Testament talking about the second advent. You also have Mark 13 and Luke 21, I think it is, is also talks about the second advent. But Matthew 24 is the one that most people will go to. So let's go there. Matthew 24 verse 40. This is after the Son of Man is coming in the clouds. It says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now the two women that were grinding at the mill, the one taken and the other left. Was one of them dead and buried? No, they're both alive. Two be in the field, the one taken, the other left. Were either of them dead? No. These are living Jews. Okay? So don't don't fall for this thing that 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. It's not about the rapture. No. It's about the rapture. That's the mystery that was revealed. The people knew about the resurrection of the dead before Paul wrote about it. Okay? Paul's not writing about the resurrection. He's writing about the rapture. Now, reason number six that I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the Christians that are alive right now and the Christians that have died and are waiting for the rapture. Uh, reason number six is because there are blood-redeemed Gentiles in heaven before the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble begins. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. We read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again. 
After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, who are these twenty-four elders? Let's keep reading here. Revelation 4.10 The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay? Now, we're going to get into these 24 elders, but I want to look here first at the thing of where are these people getting their crowns from? Where are these 24 elders, these men? Where did they get their crowns? Well, Romans 14.10 says... But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3.11-15 is the best account of this judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, you're not going to have to go through fire, you know, purgatory or something ridiculous. No, your works are going to go through fire. Which is kind of interesting, because if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, where's the judgment seat of Christ show up? You know, there are guys that are... That are that we're trying to teach a post-tribulation rapture that you go up and then you come back down again for the millennial kingdom. Now there are guys that are trying to say that there is no rapture at all. You don't even leave the earth here. You just stay on the ground. And, and when First Thessalonians 4 says about being called up into the air, meet the Lord's, or I'm sorry, to be called up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, they say, well, clouds and air actually means um, the realm of the dead or, you know, Egypt's, uh, lower valley or you know some kind of ridiculous nonsense no clouds mean clouds and air means air <laughs> okay it means going up that's what happened to john that's what's going to happen to the body of christ christians if you're saved you're going to be going up and when you get up there you know they say well you're you're just trying to explain away the tribulation because you don't want to go through it uh no no that's that's not it exactly you see, we are going to go through some tribulation, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. That's not going to be really all that much fun. If you've done a good job for the Lord, you're going to be rewarded, but you're going to see a lot of the things that you've wasted time on. You're going to see them burn up, and your works are going to be tried by fire. What's the motive behind these works? Do you go out and witness a lot so that you can appear to be a hot shot? You know, so that you can, you know, show other people up and say, I'm a good Christian because I've led thousands to the Lord. Eh, I don't know how that's going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And a lot of times these hyper soul winners, the guys that are just win souls, win souls, win souls, win souls, they compromise a lot of times just to get numbers. And that's kind of sad. The fact is, the Bible has a way of, has a very specific way of people coming to be saved. And they have to be born again. They have to become a new creature. And just praying some magical little prayer without any change in their life, eh, I'm sorry, they didn't get saved. You know, and, and you've got to be careful of those things. So, but my, my whole point is, you're going to be tried for the works that you've done 
in this life as a Christian. But when does that judgment show up? Well, it shows up sometime before the tribulation begins. Because these 24 elders, we're going to see here in a minute who they are, but they have crowns on their heads. Now, where are these crowns coming in at? Well, there are five different crowns mentioned in uh, your New Testament there. You have, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20, you have a crown of rejoicing mentioned. And that one, I think, is one that's given to a soul winner. An incorruptible crown is given to those who remain faithful. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. You can look these up. We're not going to cover this right now, but it, uh, the next one is a crown of glory given to those who feed others God's word. First Peter chapter five verses one and four, or one through four. You have a crown of righteousness given to those who love His appearing. Or think about that one. Second Timothy chapter four verses one through eight. Okay, and then you also have a crown of life, um, which the Bible talks about giving those to. An, Giving, it's given to those who endure temptation and also uh, to those who die as martyrs. And, uh, of course, the one there about the martyrs, Revelation 2.10. Now, some people say, well, these five crowns are really just one crown, you know. And you can debate that thing back and forth. I don't really know for sure. I've heard some good arguments for both sides, whether there's five separate crowns or they're just one crown. I don't know. But the point is these elders are crowned. And they show up in heaven before the Antichrist shows up. So now let's look at the thing about who these elders are. Revelation 5.8 And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Now, these 24 elders are very clearly not all completely Jews. Why? Because they're coming out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So, some of them could be Jews, you know, but there are others that are not Jews. Some from the, the Gentile type nations. Okay, verse 10, Revelation 5.10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now that's a promise given to Christians. Verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now I believe that those angels that are spoken of there are Christians. Okay, and that's going to be a big study. I'm going to actually be doing that on Sunday. Uh, we're going to be looking at angels, how they fit into the Bible, and why I believe that we, as Christians, will become angels. And it doesn't mean we're going to be these winged things up there in heaven. No, I don't believe angels had win have wings. Okay, and again, I'll get into that on Sunday. Revelation 19.1 and after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Now, here's the question. If Christians go through the tribulation, if they go through the time of Jacob's trouble, then why are they there in heaven celebrating Roman, the Roman Catholic Church's destruction? doesn't make any sense. Okay, Christians are in heaven, and by the way, I didn't cover this, but Revelation chapter 5 talks about you know, these 24 elders uh, that have been redeemed to God by the... Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And it says about the angels, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And then in Revelation chapter 6 is when the Antichrist is loosed. So you have blood-redeemed Christians, blood-redeemed saints in heaven before the Antichrist shows up. And again, I've done other studies on that. 
But here you have saints in heaven before the Antichrist shows up, and you have saints in heaven celebrating the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church. And who else really could celebrate the destruction of Rome? Mystery Babylon. Revelation 17 and 18, you can read about that. Who else would, why would the Old Testament saints celebrate the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church? They weren't the ones that were slaughtered by her. Okay? It was Christians in the church age. That's who was in heaven there. So that's the end of part two. Uh, you can listen to part three if you want. We're going to cover the last six reasons why the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Thanks for listening. All right, here we are, part three of the pre-tribulation rapture. Why? I believe that the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, just to recap, the very first part of this study was on... Uh, proving the fact that the actual proper name for this seven-year period is the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you can listen to that one. Um, a good question to ask is, somebody says, are you going to go through the tribulation? Well, what is the tribulation? And I cover that in the first study. The second study, I looked at the first six reasons why I believe that the rapture is pre-tribulation. And just to recap there quickly, reason number one, the Jews require a sign. That's why it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Reason number two, the Antichrist stands in the rebuilt temple. Okay, A Christian does not have a temple, a physical temple. They have their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Reason number three, the tribulation gospel is different than ours. There's faith in the tribulation. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ, but then you also have works involved where you can't take the mark of the beast. So it's a slightly different gospel. It's, it's not heresy to teach another gospel in the tribulation. Because they still have to have faith in Jesus Christ, but now they have a new element there where they can't take the mark of the beast. So there's faith plus works. That's why Matthew 24 says about they have to endure to the end in order to be saved. Reason number four, the rapture is said to be a mystery, first revealed to Paul. Jesus spoke to the Jews about it in John 10. They didn't understand them, and so it wasn't fully revealed until Paul shows up. That's why he says it's a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15. Reason number five, there's no such thing, or there's no mention of the resurrection of dead saints at Christ's second coming. Okay, this event of the dead coming up first and then the living coming up and going up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, that has nothing to do with the second coming. That's a separate event. And reason number six is that there are blood redeemed Gentiles. Out of every tongue, kindred, nation, the 24 elders, plus you have the angels, the thousands and thousands of them, in heaven, before the tribulation begins, before the Antichrist shows up, and then they're also there when Mystery Babylon is destroyed, and they're celebrating it. Okay? If you're saved, you're going to be part of that. Now, reason number seven. Let's continue here. Again, I have the scriptures written out. If you need to... Look these up. If you want to follow along in your Bible, then pause it because I'm really going to move fast. I want to get this thing done. Okay, reason number seven. Who is the bride of Christ? Let me ask you that. Revelation 19 verse 5 says, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints." And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, who is Jesus Christ going to marry? He's the Lamb of God, of course. Who's he going to marry? Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Matthew 25, by the way, 
there are ten virgins, and they go out to meet the bridegroom, not marry him. Okay? The body of Christ, the church, is the bride of Christ. You say, well, wait a second now. How can, the how can Christians be the body of Christ and the bride of Christ at the same time? Well, if you study the Bible, the Bible says that when marriage happens, that these two shall be one flesh. That's how it's possible. Okay, now we are espoused to Jesus Christ right now. We are engaged, essentially. But the marriage does not happen until we are with him in heaven. Now, how can you believe that we're going to go through the tribulation time period? We're going to go through that seven years of God's judgment and wrath, God beating up on the bride of Christ, and then, it, and then those that make it through somehow show up in heaven before Jesus Christ comes down at the second advent and get married to him and then go back down with him. doesn't make any sense. Now, the fact is, we go before the time of Jacob's trouble. We go up to be with the Lord. We are his sheep. He is the door. He calls to us, leads us out. We go in, go through the judgment seat of Christ, and then while the tribulation is going on down here on the earth, we are with Jesus, okay? And towards the end of it, we get married, and then we come back down for the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, which will be the honeymoon, essentially. Okay, now, another passage which is very interesting, and of course all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's the most important one, and that's where you have to rightly divide the word of truth for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So any part of the Bible can be taken for instruction in righteousness. Doctrine you have to be careful with. But now in Song of Solomon, you have a whole book written about a husband and his bride, essentially. And something very interesting here, Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 10 says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Let me just stop there for a second. I've heard a lot of people, they get, you know, they pervert the words of God there because they say, well, this has to be a mistake. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Oh, brother, they, you know, obviously don't know. You know, they were ignorant translators back then. No, the fact of the matter is that, yes, turtles do have a mating call. There's a creek around here where I live, which is called the Tulpahawken. And that is an Indian word. I'm not sure which tribe it is, but that word means um, <clears throat> land where the turtles sang and wooed. Okay, and we are, the area where I live, we're not too far from a creek within hearing distance, and you can hear the turtle singing in the springtime as part of their mating call. Now, it's not a beautiful melody like a bird, but the point is, it they do make a sound, a mating call. So yes, the turtle does sing, but the turtle only sings in the springtime with their mating season. So the Bible's correct. Don't try to change it. It's not a turtle dove or something like this. It is a turtle. Song, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 13. The tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape giveth a good, or give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now some believe that the rapture is going to happen in the spring. I hope they're right. I don't know. <clears throat> and you say, well, that, then they're setting a date, and that's a sin. No, they're not setting a date. They're just saying, well, it could happen in the spring. I don't know. I just threw that in there just as an interesting thing. I'm not trying to base doctrine, okay? That doesn't prove one thing or the other. I just threw it in as, look at this, it's interesting. Okay, but the Bible clearly teaches that Christians are the bride of Christ and that there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb before the second advent. Okay, that's number seven. Now, reason number eight. God always removes the righteous before his judgment is poured out. Okay, now, it's God's judgment. There are times that the earth, you know, the people on the earth, the unsaved, the wicked people out there, they will persecute Christians. 
Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. God doesn't spare Christians from the persecution of the wicked. But when God's wrath is poured out, he will spare those that are doing right. Now, you can read through the Old Testament, the Jews, every time that they sinned, God was wiping them out and, and, and putting, you know, giving them diseases and all kinds of stuff. But that was because they were wicked. The ones that were righteous, God always spared them. Okay, now let's look at a couple of verses. Uh, first, well, first of all, before we get into that, we're going to look at three men in the Old Testament. We're going to look at Lot, we're going to look at Noah, and we're going to look at Enoch and see how God's judgment dealt with each one of these men. Lot, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. What was the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah? Sex perversion. They were sodomites. Okay, which is your modern, or your word for your modern uh, homosexual. Uh, verse 7, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Did the Lord deliver Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. Now let's look at that. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10. We're going to read down through here, and, and uh, I'll show you exactly what happened there. <coughs> and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the gar garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Okay? It's kind of interesting how these beautiful tropical garden types of places usually draw the most perverts. Genesis 18.20 And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come up unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence, and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Did Abraham know what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm sure he did. You better believe it. Verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now think about something. What is a lot worse? What, what judgment is worse? What God did to one city, Sodom and Gomorrah, what he did to them, or what God's going to do to the whole world during the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year time period coming, where you have... A third of all the people dying, the sea being turned into blood and everything, all the water being turned into blood. Shall God judge the righteous Christians with the wicked? No, he won't. And by the way, why hasn't God destroyed this earth yet? It's because he can still find 50 righteous men in it. You know why America hasn't been destroyed yet? You know why America still has prosperity? and peace and freedom, it's because of the righteous people in it. And I'm sorry, it's not because of the con Constitution, it's not because of the Bill of Rights or the whatever, it's because there are Bible-believing Christians out there that are still getting work done for the Lord. Okay, that's what will preserve a nation, is Christians, not constitutional law. I'm all for the Constitution, I think it's the greatest system of law ever created, 
But that's not what's preserving freedom in this nation. You better understand that. But let's get back to the text here. Let's continue on. Genesis 18, 26. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken up me, uh, taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. That's the right attitude to have, by the way, when you're in prayer. You should be humble. Uh, Peradventure there shall lack fifth, five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, If I th find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Verse 29, And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there be forty found there? And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O let, o let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Okay, did God find ten righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah? No, he found one. And by the way, if you read the story there, <clears throat> we're not going to read anymore, but if you read about it, you'll see that Lot was really the only one that wanted to leave. His wife turned back and was turned to a pillar of salt, and his two daughters, it's kind of like they were forced to leave. Okay, and then they ended up doing some pretty bad stuff after that. Again, that's another study. But God, re God removed Lot before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. He did not slay the righteous with the wicked. Okay, now what about a worldwide judgment? Has there ever been a time when the whole earth was judged, like will be happening in the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble? In the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, it's not going to be just a little local thing here and a little local thing there where God kind of pours his wrath out. No, it's going to be worldwide. Okay? Did that ever happen before? Yes, in the days of Noah. So let's look at Noah. And let's look at what the Bible has to say about this. Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, now, this coming of the Son of Man there is speaking of the second advent. But you're going to see this thing of, it's going to be really, really bad throughout the tribulation, but God's going to spare those tribulation saints through that time period. But now let's look at Luke chapter 17. And as it was in the days of Noah... So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. For they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, of course, something else you have to understand here is sometimes it says about in the day, <clears throat> meaning in that time period there, that tribulation time period. Then you ha also have the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And remember from other studies there that the Jews are told to flee Jerusalem. They're told to get out of Jerusalem. So, like Lot, remember, Jerusalem is called, in, in Revelation 11, it's called Sodom and Egypt. So, like Lot, they're going to have to flee, and they're going to have to leave their earthly possessions behind. Okay, that's what Lot had to do. Okay, Luke, Luke 17, verse 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. 
Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. In other words, you're going to have to leave all of your financial wealth behind if you are a Jew in Jerusalem. Okay, if you're over there and, and you know, the Lord's coming back and you see the Antichrist in the temple, standing in the holy place, you better run. Don't try to get your coin collection or your, you know, whatever, your, your fancy Mercedes in the garage. Leave it. Run. Get out of there. Okay, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto the, to him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Read Revelation chapter 19. What he's talking about there is when Jesus Christ comes back down, the armies of the Antichrist are going to be there to fight him. And of course, Jesus Christ is going to wipe them out. And like I said, read Revelation 19. You'll read about the thing of the eagles being gathered together to eat the flesh of all these men that God's, that the Lord's going to kill. And that's going to happen. Uh, kind of rough for the pacifist, I guess. But okay, now the point I'm trying to make here is that at this time period there, where you have the Antichrist standing in the temple and you have them trying to flee, trying to get out of there, you're going to have people that are going to have to run and get out to a certain area there. Some say this lost city of Petra thing. I don't know. There's there's a lot of different angles to that whole thing. But when Jesus Christ is going to be revealed from heaven, you need to be ready for that if you're a Jew in the tribulation. That's what this is talking about. Now, this has nothing to do with Christians. Why? Well, because read Revelation 19. We're up in heaven, marriage supper of the Lamb, and we get with Jesus Christ as armies, and we follow him down. Okay, we're not down on the earth and having to watch for his coming. No, we're up in heaven with him. As Jesus said, he brought the sheep in, and then we go out with him. Okay, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now, let's ask a couple questions here. Was Noah saved from God's judgment? Yes. Did Noah have to go through the flood? Yes. Did Noah lose all of his earthly possessions? Yeah, essentially. I mean, I don't know what all he had on the ark, but you can be sure he didn't take his house with him and whatever else he owned. So yes, he lost his possessions. Okay, now was the earth cleansed after the flood? Yes. Now let's apply that to the time of Jacob's trouble. Are the Jews going to be saved from God's judgment? Well, if they don't take the mark of the beast, yes. Are they going to have to go through the tribulation? Yes. Just like Noah went through the flood. Are they going to lose all their possessions? Yes. They will. Okay, now is the earth going to be cleansed after the second advent? Yes. Absolutely. So you see, there is a similarity between Noah and a tribulation saint. But now let me ask you a question. This last time that this world catastrophe, this worldwide judgment, and I shouldn't have said catastrophe because it was God's wrath uh, on the wicked world because they were living in sin and they weren't repenting of it. And that's exactly why the Lord's going to do this thing again. He's going to pour out his wrath and his judgment on the lost world for seven years. Now, the question is, was anybody raptured before the flood? You know, I'm teaching here a pre-tribulation rapture. So is there was there a type of that 
Did that happen before the flood in the days of Noah? And the answer to that is yes. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to study about Enoch. It says here, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. <coughs> uh, it's interesting to note there, by the way, that uh, a Jewish calendar, there are 360 days in their year. A Gentile calendar, there are 365 days in a year. Just found that kind of interesting because Enoch lived 365 years. Kind of interesting. But let's look at another point here. Enoch is the only man in the entire Bible to escape death. Okay? And you say, well, what about Elijah? Well, Elijah uh, was taken up into heaven, but he's going to be coming back down in Revelation 11, and he's going to be killed by the beast. So, no, he didn't. He escaped death for now, but he'll be you know, being killed in the tribulation. You say, well, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross. No, the only one who ever escaped death is Enoch. He never comes back down. He never has to come back down here and die again. And No. So who's he a picture of? He gets raptured away, taken, called up, before God's judgment, before God's worldwide judgment, on a wicked world that rejected God. And he never has to die. Now, who's that a type of? It's a type of a Christian in the church age that is alive at the rapture. You get raptured up. You never have to experience death. You never have to come back down and die again. You come back down, you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. You will have an incorruptible body at that point. By the way, that's how we're going to be able to rule and reign with Jesus Christ for the thousand years because we have the mind of Christ, because we have an incorruptible body. Can you imagine Christians right now trying to run the earth? <laughs> yeah. You'd have Baptists arguing with Methodists and Presbyterians, you know, with, uh, <clears throat> you know, whoever. It'd be a mess. Uh, it's not going to be that way. We're going to be changed, conformed to the image of Christ. We're going to be, we're going to understand things as He understands things. That's how we're going to be able to judge. But now Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 speaks again of Enoch. It says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay? That's a type of a Christian. Now what about this thing of translation? Translated. Okay, Enoch being translated. Was anybody else in the Bible translated? Well, this is also very interesting. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now isn't it interesting that the only two groups, or the only two people, so to speak, in the Bible that are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, number one, you have Enoch being translated there in Hebrews, Hebrews, and number two, you have Christians. Colossians is where it's written. Not in the Old Testament to the Jews, not in a in the future tribulation period. No, it's written to Christians. Christians are translated. I thought that was also very interesting. Jude chapter 1 verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now how on earth can you put Christians into the tribulation 
we're going to be ex- executing judgment upon ungodly sinners. How can you fit a Christian into that context there of, of Jude one fifteen? Well, Jude 15. I realize there's only one chapter. <clears throat> but it's interesting. Why would Enoch prophesy way back before the flood happened? Why would Enoch prophesy about the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints? That's very interesting as well. But let's move on to the next point. Point number nine. Saved Christians are not appointed to God's wrath. Okay, just like Noah having to go through the flood, that's a picture of a tribulation saint. They didn't have to, God's wrath wasn't poured out on them, but they had to endure through it. They had to make it. Okay, Enoch left before God's wrath. And that's what's going to happen with Christians. Now let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we which are alive, you know, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, that's whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. God hath not appointed us to wrath. Okay, Luke 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea. Are you in Judea? Who's in Judea? Jews. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Upon who? The ungodly, the, the wicked sinners. Luke 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When will the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled? At the end of Jacob's uh, trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. At the end of Daniel's 70th week. Why? Because in the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ sets up his earthly kingdom and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Okay, you can study that whole thing out. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Who is the wrath of God for? It's for the lost world. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Very clearly talking about lost people, ungodly sinners. It's not talking about Christians that are going to have to endure to the end. That's nonsense. Romans 2, seven, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. Save people. Verse 8, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Look at verse 9, Romans 2.9, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So you see there, God's wrath is being poured out not on the believers, but on those who disobey the truth. Okay? Lost people to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 For they themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, Jesus Christ saves from hell, but he also saves from God's wrath, the outpouring of God's wrath, which is fully manifest in the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year great tribulation. Revelation 15.1. We're going to read the entire chapter here. It's not a very long chapter. 
It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now notice there it said in verse 3, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now remember what I said earlier about in, this, in the second study about the gospel being different. There's faith plus works, keeping the commandments, plus the faith of Jesus. So who were the commandments revealed to? Moses. So you have the song of Moses. Who are you to have faith in? Jesus Christ. So you have the song of the Lamb. See, it's not, those aren't Christians as in church age Christians. Those are tribulation saints. Okay, Revelation 15, 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, in the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. <coughs> and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Okay, so you have there Revelation 15. You have God's wrath being poured out. Now let's look at uh, another thing here with the, the wrath of the Lord. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now who is he? Revelation 19.16 And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay, now that's Jesus Christ very clearly. 1 Corinthians 12.27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So now let me ask you a question. Jesus Christ is coming back down there in Revelation 19. Revelation 15, the entire chapter is about God's wrath. And then at the end, you know, when the tribulation is winding up, you have Jesus Christ coming out to pour out wrath. So if we're not appointed to wrath, how on earth are we fitting into this whole scenario? If you believe that Christians go through the tribulation, how do you reconcile all this stuff? See, it doesn't work. Now, there's some people that are a little bit closer to the truth. They're still wrong, but they're a little bit closer. They recognize that Christians are not appointed to God's wrath, so they say, well, I believe pre-wrath. I believe that, you know, about halfway through the tribulation, Christians go up. Well, no, it's before the tribulation, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm covering them here. But at least they recognize the fact that a Christian is not going to go through God's wrath. But if you believe that Christians go through the tribulation, then please explain to me how 1 Corinthians 12.27 says that we are members of the body of Christ, but yet Christ is coming back down in Revelation 19 to pour out wrath. Okay? You, you can't reconcile this stuff. It's ridiculous to believe that you're going to have to go through the tribulation. It's nonsense. Okay, now 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13 also says something else which is interesting pertaining to this. It says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And again, you're seeing that thing. Time and time again about, you know, we shall be kings and priests on the earth. You're seeing that. Blood redeemed saints in heaven saying that we're going to reign on the earth. And right here it's written, 
2 Timothy. Now that's pointed directly at Christians. I don't. I just don't know how people can miss all this. But it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If you are a Christian right now, and you deny Jesus Christ, if you're ashamed of him, he will deny your millennial inheritance. Okay, in, in that sense. That's how he will deny you. But it says here, he cannot deny himself. You are a member of the body of Christ. When you get saved, you are put into Christ's body. Okay, he can't deny you at that point. You are sealed. Now, that's not true for a tribulation saint. It's true for a Christian in the church age. Okay, point number 10. We're getting close to being done here. This is a long study. But uh, let's look at point number 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, well, point number 10 is Matthew 24 is doctrinally in the Old Testament. I made reference to this earlier in this study. And I think a lot of Christians don't understand that. When did the New Testament begin? Well, let's look here and we'll read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tab tabernacle was yet standing. Okay? The way into the holiest of all, to be saved, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, that was not yet made manifest. So let's continue here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. Which was a figure of the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to, serving, to serve the living God? Uh, Hebrews 9.15 And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Okay, who brought in the New Testament? Jesus Christ did. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they excuse me, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16. Now here's where it's important. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. I'll ask it again. When did the New Testament start? You say, well, Matthew chapter 1 is the beginning of the New Testament. No, Matthew chapter 1 is the beginning of a collection of books called the New Testament. But the actual New Testament did not start until the death of the testator. And Jesus Christ is the testator. He is the one who brought in the New Testament. So anything before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is doctrinally in the Old Testament. Now some of it will overlap with church age doctrine. Okay, I'm not saying you can't read any of the four Gospels. There's nothing in there for Christians. I'm not one of those. Okay, that's a hyper-dispensational position. There are, there are lots of things in the four Gospels that apply to Christians today. But doctrinally, you have to be very careful. That's why when people go back to Matthew 24, they get all kinds of false doctrine. Why? Because Jesus is speaking to Jews and he's speaking to Jews that are going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're going to have to endure to the end. Okay, it's not written to a Christian in the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand the, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What wasn't made known? What was the what was the mystery there? Well, Ephesians 3, 6 tells you what it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay? God knew about Gentiles eventually getting saved, but it was hidden from the eyes of the Jews. Okay? It was not understood. Now, you can find some little parts here and there in the Gospels and even back into the Old Testament that kind of look like, okay, Jews are going to get, or Gentiles are going to be saved someday. But those were things that people really didn't understand. Now, let, let me give you a modern day example of that. I've seen a lot of commentaries that were written back in the 1960s and 1970s. And when they hit Revelation chapter 13, where it says about the mark of the beast being in the forehead or in the hand, they say, well, obviously this is a mistranslation. You can't have a mark that will control buying and selling. You can't have something in your hand like that. And, you know, you go back the whole way back to 1611. I have a photographic copy of an original 1611 authorized version, which is known today as the King James Version. And it says, in the forehead, in the hand. Okay, so that is an old reading, almost 400 years old now. Um, and I believe it's the correct reading too, by the way. But for years, people questioned it. Why? Well, because they didn't understand it. It's there in the Bible. It's very clear that it's in the forehead, in the hand. But people didn't understand it for a long time. But people understand it now. Now we have implantable microchips that can hold all of your financial information on it. And it's some pretty scary stuff when you study it. So... There are things that will be in the Bible, but they won't be revealed until later. Okay, you read back in the book of Daniel, he's told to seal up these things which he's being shown until the time of the end. In other words, you aren't going to understand this stuff, Daniel. It's not going to make a bit of sense to you, but in the time of the end, it will make sense. It will be unsealed. Okay. Let's look at the next point here. Um, point number 11. The trump of God is sounded at the rapture. Okay, now 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians four sixteen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of of God. It does not say trumpet. It says trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now what is this trump of God? Well, the trump there is the sound that a trumpet makes. And I'm going to show you why that's very important. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and be heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And of course he turns around and he sees... Um, the Lord Jesus there speaking with him. Uh, but Revelation 4, one, we we'll skip ahead to that. And it says here, And after this, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay? So you have the trumpet talking with John. Now we've been over that before, but I just wanted to read it again to reinforce this. 
John chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now let me ask you a question after reading these verses. Where is the trump of God sounded at Christ's second coming? Read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Joel, the book of Joel. Read any account of the second coming, the second advent of Jesus Christ, and please show me where a trump of God is being sounded. This is something completely different. Okay, To a saved Christian, God's voice is going to sound like a trumpet to you. Okay, That's why it's called the trump of God. It's not a trumpet. God's not picking up a trumpet and blowing through it. It's his voice. And his voice is what sounds like a trumpet. All right, that's important to get. He doesn't play a trumpet. He speaks and we hear his voice and it sounds like a trumpet. Now, if you study this out too, you can see that a lost person, when they hear God's voice, they say it thundered. It sounds like thunder. So at the rapture, we're going to hear our name. He knows us as his sheep and he calls us by name and leads us out. He's the door that we see in heaven and we'll hear our, our name And we'll be called out. And it'll sound like a trumpet talking with us. It's not going to be a trumpet. You know, and then we leave. No, it's going to be a voice that'll sound musical, like a trumpet. Okay, God's not going to play a trumpet. And you don't see that at the second advent. You can search all the passages. Check it out. And you'll see I'm not telling, or I'm not lying to you. Okay, now reason number 12 the final reason, uh, this has been a long study, and um, I don't normally like to do these three-part messages or something because I know that people are very busy, and I don't like to spend a whole lot of time ranting and raving, and you know, I like to stay in the Bible, and uh, I'm a Bible believer. I mean, that's that's all I can say. But now let's look at. Reason number 12, that the rapture will be pre-tribulation. And this is one of the most important. Reason number 12 is because it is a purifying hope. If you believe that Jesus Christ could come back at any time, you're not going to be worried about the Antichrist and going through seven years and having to endure the end and all that. You're going to be thinking about Jesus Christ. And all these Christians that are post-tribulation rapturists, they're all worried about, you know, the country and all how things are going and all no. See, they're worried about carnal things, earthly things. But a Christian who's looking for Jesus Christ to come back at any time and realize I could be at the judgment seat of Christ in a, in the next week. <laughs> That's something to think about. You're going to be busy about the Lord's work. But let me, let me read a couple of verses here quick and then we'll close the study. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It is amazing. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when we know, excuse me, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When Jesus Christ comes in the clouds and catches us up, we're going to be changed. And it's going to be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. If you're saved, you are currently a son or a daughter of God. Okay? But you still have your corruptible earthly body. You're not changed yet, but you will be. You will be like Christ. 1 John 3, 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now that's so important because if you live with the expectation that Jesus Christ could come back in the next five minutes, you're going to purify yourself. You're going to think before you sin because you don't want to be caught sinning when Jesus Christ comes back. Let's look at Philippians 3.18 and uh, we're going to see why what happens when you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. What happens to you? Philippians 3.18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, 
that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay, let me just stop there for just a second. Now, I do believe that this is talking about lost people, and I'm not saying that, you know, if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, you're lost. No, I don't believe that. But you do mind earthly things. Okay, I'm giving you some instruction in righteousness here, some reproof, some correction. You see, if you're not expecting Jesus Christ to come back, then who are you expecting? You're expecting the Antichrist to show up. You're expecting the New World Order to show up. You're expecting the Mark of the Beast and everything else. And you're getting yourself all psyched up and all prepared for this thing because you've got to endure to the end. So you're minding earthly things. But let's look back at the, the passage here, Philippians 3.20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If you are a Christian, your conversation should be in heaven, and you should be looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you realize he's going to change your vile body in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like that. You're going to hear God speaking to you, calling you out because you are his child. You are, If you are saved, you're not going to go through God's wrath and his judgment for seven years. Don't fall for that. Live with the expectation that Jesus Christ could come back today. Pass out tracts. Witness. Preach on the street. Go door to door. Get on the internet. There's tons of ministry opportunities on the internet. Get on YouTube. Put Christian videos on YouTube. Get on these message boards and stuff. If you feel led, go on Facebook and, and witness. There are so many opportunities to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't get sidetracked with this thing of, I'm going to have to endure the tribulation and, and get all messed up with, Looking at the development of the kingdom of Antichrist, you can study the thing of the New World Order. You can study that. I have. But don't get sidetracked on that. Your conversation is to be in heaven. You're to think about laying up treasures in heaven. Not on this earth. Not, i got a stockpile for seven years because I have to endure to the end. No. Think about your rewards in heaven. Think about the judgment seat of Christ. Think about your millennial inheritance. If you suffer with Jesus Christ, you will reign with Jesus Christ. Those are the things that you need to think about. Thank you for listening to all three parts of this study. Uh, if you have any questions, um, anything that you don't think I covered or whatever, uh, please feel free to contact us. Um, if you disagree with me and, and you refuse to change and you say, I don't care what he says, I believe we're going to go through the tribulation, well... Okay, if if you're not going to, you know, change your mind, I'm not going to change my mind, so, you know, don't waste my time, okay? Uh, if you do have some sincere questions and sincere, you know, things that you think I didn't answer, well, go ahead and contact me. But um, I'm very busy for the Lord because I'm expecting Jesus Christ to come back soon. And I think it could be this year. I'm not setting a date. I'm just expecting him to come today. I'll expect him tomorrow um, if he doesn't come today. I can't wait to see Jesus Christ. And that's really the whole point there. See, it's not about, oh, I, I just want to get out of trouble. I don't, I don't want to go through anything bad. That isn't it. I want to go to be with Jesus. And if you're saved, that should be the main desire of your heart. Not only to be reunited with your dead, saved uh, loved ones, and also with the saints and everything, all the Christians that have lived down through the centuries, that's going to be great. But the best part of it all is going to be going to be with Jesus Christ and getting to meet our Savior face to face and realize I don't have to worry about sin anymore. That's what I'm looking forward to. So keep that in mind. Again, if you have any questions, please contact us. We'll try to be of any help that we can. Thank you very much for listening.